It's good to see everybody. As I told you uh, last week, my goal in teaching what I'm talking about today is to alleviate some of the confusion that's been uh, in the body of Christ. And, and we're going to be looking not only at Scripture, but a little at church history uh, throughout this teaching. And, and what we're talking about is imperative. It's, it's something that needs to be understood and learned and then taken and held on to, all right? We're talking about incremental forgiveness or the myth of incremental uh, forgiveness. And what is that? What is incremental forgiveness? Well, it's the idea that God deals out forgiveness in portions, that God doles it out a little at a time on a per sin basis. And as we confess that sin, then God doles out enough forgiveness to remove that sin from us. But I want to show you today that forgiveness, the forgiveness of all of our sins is based solely upon the one time sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, upon the cross. Amen? You see, in many Christian circles, Christians are taught that forgiveness is a, um, a conditional thing. It's a, a responsive action from God, that God just simply responds to someone who says, God, look, I blew it, and uh, I, I'm sorry I did, and uh, you know, I'm returning from that sin, and I'm repenting from that sin, and I'm asking you now to come and to please forgive me of my sin. And so each time you sin... Uh, we're, we're taught and have been taught for, for many, many, many years. And just because you've heard something for many, 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 many years doesn't make it right. And it doesn't make it the truth. People can be, can be blind for, for a long time. Look at the children of Israel, huh? 40 years out in the wilderness going through literal hell out there in the wilderness, and they still didn't get it. So, you know, just because something is understood a certain way for a long period of time doesn't mean that it hasn't devi deviated somewhere along the path from truth. Amen? And so it's important for us to understand. And so this idea that one must go to God, ask him to personally forgive them each and every time they sin is, is something that we need to, to examine, look at through scripture, through church history, and understand that God just isn't responding, uh, you know, on a, on a per sin basis to our lives. And, you know, this is what we believe. We believe that if we sin, we ask God to forgive us of our sin. God instantly responds to that sin. He forgives us of that sin. He removes that sin, ensuring us that we maintain our salvation and keep us from a devil's hell. That's the way we've been taught. Is that true or not? It's true. Amen? Now, that may sound plausible to a religious mind, but according to the Scripture, that's not true at all. It's not true in any shape, fashion, or form. You see, the Scripture actually teaches us that God in Christ has already not only forgiven our sins, but he's actually forgiven the sins of the entire world. Now, he's forgiven the sins of the entire world in someone. It's in Jesus. In Jesus, total forgiveness is available, right? But God has already taken care of the sins of the world forever, and if they'll come into Jesus, they can receive that benefit. Isn't that right? The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to him. The word impute there is logizomai. It's an accounting term. He's not crediting sin any longer to their account. That's what it means, logizomai, not accrediting to one's account. God is not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed us to the, uh, uh, the word. He's given us the word. What's the word? Our word, the church's word to the world, is one of reconciliation. Somebody say reconciliation. reconciliation. Now, that word reconciliation is the word colosso, and it's, it's a Greek word, and it means to return to favor, to return one to favor with. And so what, what our, our assignment is as a church is to tell the world God has restored you to favor with him. You can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ because in him all sin has been dealt with forever. Amen? That, that word catalysio also means to exchange for something for equal value. You know, I've told you this many times, but God saw in you equal value to himself. God adorned himself in human flesh. Why? To give himself as a ransom for you. Amen? God saw in you equal value, so he gave his own son on your behalf. He exchanged the son of God for you. Jesus became sin so that you could become righteous. 
That's what God did. God is madly in love with us. And nothing will ever change his mind. Our, our ignorance won't change his mind. Our hard-heartedness won't change his mind. Our thinking in our mind that somehow we could do something that could please God enough where God would accept us, that ain't going to change his mind. He's telling you, listen, I've taken care of all sin for all time. There is peace between me and you, and nothing will ever in a gazillion years change that fact. So I want you to learn this fact. I want you to know this fact so that you can walk in right standing with me in your minds because so many of us don't. Condemnation and guilt and fear and all the other things that want to drive us away from God, cause us to run from God, begins to fill our hearts and minds. Isn't that true? The accuser of the brethren, he comes in, tries ripping on your head a while. Right? Amen? So, listen, as far as God's concerned, he's never going to allow sin to ever separate man from him again. Ever. Never. All right? So, all men must do is just freely accept what God's freely gave. What if God freely give? He gave us life. Now, how did, what, how did we get that life? Well, we received that life from, from Jesus Christ, right? Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. That's the whole point of him coming on planet Earth is to give you life. See, he could take away your sin, but if he didn't give you life, what good is that? Right? You would just be, you'd just, you'd just be a zero. You know, you're a negative 10 because you're in sin, but once you're saved, you're a zero. You need something to get you to a positive 10, right? That's life. God came to give you life and life more abundant. Now, now listen, this is the way we think. God did not send Jesus to the cross to create some sort of forgiveness bank. This is the way I was kind of put it, you know, in my thinking, where we can go to him when we sin, when we fall, when we make mistakes, so we can go to him and make forgiveness withdrawals. You know, when we blow it, we go to the bank and say, listen, God, forgive me. I repent of that sin. Now I need uh, to, to have forgiveness come out of that bank, and I need it to cleanse me of my sins. But, you know, this is exactly how the church has treated this, this, this idea of forgiveness. Isn't that true? It's like when we sin, we need to, uh, to draw uh, enough forgiveness out of that bank to take care of that particular sin uh, in our lives. And if we're sorry enough and if we repent hard enough, which in our minds, repenting means to be, come, a, come down to, a, to an altar and cry our head out and just bang our head against the wall and, and just be like Peter when Peter said, you know, I, I'm a sinful man. Get away from me. Get away from me. Get away from me, Jesus. I, you know... That is not what it means. Repent means to change your mind. That's what all, all it means. It doesn't mean to pay penance. And that's what the church has made it to be. Repentance, to repent, to pay penance to God. That's been profitable for the church. But it's wrong. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. However, we think if, if, if we ask God to forgive us of our sins, then he forgives us of our sins, and we turn from those sins... If we sin again, then we have to go back again to him to make more forgiveness withdrawals. And that's what I mean by incremental forgiveness. We think that we have to keep short accounts with God, constantly asking God to forgive us of our sins, or otherwise we risk going to hell. But folks, that is not the way it is at all. Christ, in Christ, God has emptied the forgiveness bank once and for all. Why? There's no more forgiveness bank. Why is that? Because God took the sins of the entire world, all the sins in the past, all the sins in the present, all the sins in the future, and he has fully paid completely and even overpaid for those sins once and for all through the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen in this house. Amen? amen. And so he provided, the Bible says, eternal redemption. It's been eternally done. He provided uh, a way out for us. Amen? And it's through Christ. And in doing so, Jesus removed every bit of distance between God and man. And that's where Satan likes to come in in Christians' lives. He, he wants to try to convince you that somehow there's distance between you and God. And then what he'll do is he'll point to all your inconsistencies. Listen, I don't care how fine you get your life. He'll even talk about your prayer time. You didn't pray hard enough. You see, you'll go in there and pray five minutes. He said, you should have prayed 25 minutes. Even in your Bible reading, he'll say, you didn't read the Bible enough. And then you start saying, well, I'll read more. You read the whole Bible. You didn't read it twice. 
You know, if you go out, hey, you didn't witness enough. You didn't talk about Jesus enough. You didn't shine your light bright enough. Listen, you don't even have to do sinful things. He'll torment you over righteous acts, much less anything, any failure in your life. So if you start listening to him, he's going to put you on the treadmill of religious works and he's going to keep you tormented and you're going to be like this stupid uh, mice that run in that cage going nowhere, right? Don't let him manipulate you like that. He's a liar. Jesus has removed every bit of distance between God and man. He did it all through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? So all of our sins, say this way, all my sins, past, present, and future were paid in full and completely removed forever when Jesus died on the cross. Amen. Now, let me show you how this works. You know, we looked at Abraham, and Abraham is very important. It's, he's extremely important to us because it's in, it's in Abraham that God reveals what he's going to do through the Messiah, right? Let's look what happens in Romans 4. It says, Abraham, God made a promise to Abraham, Right? And it says, he did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. So God said, this is what I'm going to do. Abraham said, it's good to go with me, God. I believe it. It's true, right? And therefore, because he believed what God said, it was accounted to him for righteousness. He had right standing with God from that point forward. Because of a belief. Isn't that something? Now, it was not written. This is the whole point of it even being put in the Bible, this little story. It wasn't written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But also for us. It's for our benefit. Because in that same way, it says here, talking about righteousness, shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered because of our offenses. Jesus was delivered to death to the cross because of our offenses, right? Amen? And was raised because of our justification. Somebody say amen to that. So the scripture's clear that, that uh, righteousness triumphed over sin. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Isn't that true? Now, this is why it's so important that this took place just through a belief. And the reason being, listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. In the Garden of Eden, Satan came and beguiled Eve, lied to her, deceived her, and told her that she could become by her doing. In other words, you can be like God if you'll do this, if you'll eat from that forbidden tree, right? And so Eve, Adam and Eve, both ingested a belief. And when they ingested a belief that they could become something by their doing, they fell. Now, see, God made man in his image and in his likeness, right? There's no way they could improve themselves by anything that they did. But Adam and Eve both believed that they could improve their standing with God by the things that they did. And when they did that, the Bible says they died, right? Spiritually died. There was separation, not from God from them, but from them from God. They became enemies in their minds because of their wicked works, right? And what do they do? They ran. When God comes calling, where are you? They're hiding in the bushes. And why? Because they're afraid of God now. This, this person, this God that they walked with each and every day in the garden, because they thought they could improve themselves by their doing, they now fear him. Think about that. Abraham reversed the curse through a belief. He believed what God said. And when, when he believed what God said, God says, okay, what happened to you and Adam? I'm reversing that, and now I'm calling you righteous because you believed. That's good news because it wasn't just written for him. It was written for our sakes. And so now we know that through a belief, we can be made right with God. Through a belief in who? Well, God tells us the focus of our belief is to be who? Jesus Christ the one who took our sins, the one who was buried, left sin in the grave, and rose, why? For our justification, so that we would be justified in the sight of God. 
It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So righteousness then becomes effective and imputed within us when we believe what God has said about Jesus. God says Jesus is the Savior of the world. God says he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. When we believe that, when we receive that as truth, that God has sent a sacrifice for us that will wash away all of our sins for all time, when we believe that, guess what happens? That belief instantly makes us righteous. Apart from any works whatsoever. Isn't that beautiful? That's a beautiful picture. Now, John tells us that we're highly favored and greatly loved. Amen? As he is, so are we in this world. Now look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. He says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins... Read it. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Ready? Read. Your sins what? Have what? Your sins have what? Your sins have what? Your sins have been forgiveness. So what I'm trying to tell you is the forgiveness bank is closed. God forgave the whole world one time, one time, one sacrifice, once and for all. And if you're going to enjoy the benefit of forgiveness, you have to get it by Christ, by faith, by trusting in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Look what Paul says in in Acts chapter 13. He says in verse 38, Therefore, let it be known to you, this is the message of the church to the world, brethren, that through this man, through Jesus, is preached to you. What am I to preach to you? The what? That in Christ you're... That's the message. That's everybody's message. That's the world. The, our, our message to the world is, is that you've been reconciled to God. God has, is not holding any of your trespasses against you. So come, come into the family. Come on, come on into the family. Enjoy this benefit. Get into the family so you can enjoy all, of the, all this. Amen? So incremental, incremental forgiveness is completely off the table, folks. Sin was dealt a bl- deadly blow once and for all. You know... Paul said it, that sin no longer has any dominion over you. It has none. There is no dominion over you. Amen? It has no dominion. Now, even though the, the New Testament teaches this truth, and it does, if you look from, from uh, you know, the, the entire New Testament, you can see it teaches this truth. This idea of incremental forgiveness has not gone away, and I'll tell you why. It's because Satan didn't want it to. Because it's working. It works in the hearts of people. And because this falsity keeps hanging around the body of Christ, fear and doubt, it runs rampant in the hearts and minds of God's people. It fills their hearts. Many Christians are afraid of God. Why? Well, they fear his judgment. They fear retribution for their failures. They fear retaliation for their sins. You know, um, when in Liar Liar, when uh, uh, Jim Carrey was... D- you know, having things happen to him, you know, he was, he kept saying, I'm reaping what I sow, I'm reaping what I sow, I'm reaping what I sow, you know. That's the way Christians run around all the time, right? This is what's going on in their mind. They, they, they go around carrying tremendous guilt, living with lifelong condemnation over their failures and their weaknesses. Folks, let me tell you something. Look at me right now. Every one of us fail. Every one of us have weaknesses. Every one of us have sin. We will continue to sin to the day we leave this body. Now, I don't like it, and you don't like it, and that's not who we are, but that is just a fact of life. Just get to it, all right? No one's approving it. No one's saying, let's live a lascivious lifestyle. No one's saying, heck yeah, man, we're forgiven. Let's go out and sin. That is not what we're talking about. But I'm just telling you that the fact of life is we're all missing the mark. That's what sin means, harmatea, the Greek word. It just simply means to miss the mark, to be blind. You cannot see, all right? You've been, you've been um, blinded for a moment. You end up doing something you shouldn't have done, and then when you come to your senses, you go, holy crap, why did I do that? Right? It means just to miss the mark. We're going to continue to miss the mark until we leave this body. And so we better learn what Jesus did with sin once and for all so that we're not having to live most of our Christian life with our heads held down in shame. We might as well believe what God has done for us and raise our heads and say, you know what? 
their sin is not going to have dominion over me in Jesus' name. We're going to see. Now, we're going to see this. It's vital that you see this, all right? So in this vacuum, you know, Satan has filled people's minds with fear and doubt and, and guilt and condemnation. Listen, a loving relationship with God cannot be built when, when it's built on fear. How, how many of you can have a nice, loving relationship when the person that wants to love you, you're scared to death of them? Afraid at any moment they're going to blow their stack. You know, at any moment, you know, they may do anything to you, right? You can't do that. There cannot be a loving relationship in, the envir- in an environment like that. In fact, in a, in a relationship like that, you want to get out of it pretty quickly. Isn't that true? You want to be free of it. So you can see how this, this idea of, of incre- incremental forgiveness has been instrumental in leading a lot of believers into a mindset of error and has facilitated a, a genuine misunderstanding of the Scriptures and what Jesus actually did for us on the cross. Case in point is 1 John 1, 9. You see, if you'll understand this, you've got to go, you got to hear this. Please hear this. There's not one Scripture in the New Testament, not one, Now, remember, the New Testament begins after the death of Jesus Christ. A testament does not come into force until the death of the testator. You understand? And so from the moment Jesus died, from that moment forward, there's not one scripture, not one in the New Testament that tells you you must ask God to continually forgive you. But they will point to John, 1 John 1, 9, not understanding church history, not understanding who in the world John's even talking to. Because that's the only one they can point to that, that, that tells us, you know, you need to confess your sins. All right? There's not one. Look what it says. It says, if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we covered the book of 1 John extensively in this church. I've got a whole series on the book of 1 John, all right? So I want to cover this very quickly. And we mentioned this a little bit last week. But to understand this verse, you got to see it within the context that's written. And you got to see it within within its historical context. And if you study the context at verse 9, you see that the first chapter of of, um, of 1 John is all about fellowship. You notice what it reads from from the, the first verse until you get even, you know, to the end, let's just say that, of the, of the chapter, you find that it's all about fellowship. That's what it's about, all right? And the reason why is because the audience that, that John's writing to in the first chapter, they didn't have fellowship with Christ. They're lost. These guys were not believers. So in the first chapter, John's actually addressing a group of people who were not in the fellowship of the church. And we'll look at a few verses real quickly. In verse 3, it says, we, who's the we? Yeah, the church. We, the church, declare to you. Who's the you? If we, the church, is talking, then whoever they're talking to has to be outside the church. Make sense? Okay. We declare to you, I'm writing these things to you, that you may also have fellowship with us. Who's the us? The church. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So the people in, that, that John's talking to in the first chapter are people who are not in fellowship with the church, and they're not in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if you want to have fellowship with us, our fellowship is with the Son. Our fellowship is with the Father. Right? You see, John was writing in the first chapter here to those who were troubling the church with their false teachings. The church was brand new. It was just getting off the ground, and we were just in it a few, uh, you know, 100 years, not even 100 years yet. And so there were these little home churches, and they would be meeting in different places, and everybody with every kind of belief would come into the church. You understand? They had all kinds of beliefs. You know, this thing was new, guys. All right? And so these Gnostics had a, had a, had a, had a following. And these Gnostics brought all kinds of heresies into the church. So the first chapter of John is, is, is designed to, to uh, address these heretical teachings uh, of the Gnostics. And so the Gnostics, they didn't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. They thought Jesus was an aberration of some sort of hologram. They didn't believe that God would stoop so low as to adorn human flesh, right? In fact, they believed that knowing God was unknowable. You could not know God. 
In other words, you, you couldn't have a relationship with God. They also believed that sin wasn't real because they believe that men are spiritual beings and therefore anything they do in the natural body doesn't count because uh, it's of flesh, right? They also believe salvation came through knowledge. That's what Gnostic means. It just simply means knowledge. They believe you could get to know God just through knowledge. And so the Gnostics, the Bible says, or John's saying to them, you don't have the truth. You, you don't know the truth. They walked in darkness. And if you'll read the chapter with this understanding that, that actually John is trying to um, speak into the lives of these Gnostics and to all these heretical teachings, it makes, all, it makes perfect sense. And so the first chapter was written um, to confront a major heresy that was going on in the church. Now, listen, this is not, not me saying this. You can look in any concordance. You can look probably in the margin of your Bible. It will talk about the Gnostics. All right, this isn't something I came up with. This is, this is church history. This is fact. This is not my idea. This is not some new thing. This is something that's been known since the first century. Okay? And so John says to them, yes, Jesus did come in the flesh. And by the way, sin is real, and we all sin. But in Christ, we have fellowship now with the Son, and we have fellowship now with the Father, and we walk in truth, and we don't walk in darkness because the truth is in us. Notice how he begins the letter, all right? He says in 1 John 1, 1, this is why he says this. That which we, uh, I'm sorry, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. Notice, we heard him, we saw him, which we have looked upon. Yeah. And our hands have handled. He wasn't some hologram, some aspiration, you know, with some, some figment of my imagination. I, I touched this guy concerning the word of life. The life was manifest, revealed right before us. And we have seen and we bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, now we're going to declare it to you, right? That you also may have fellowship with us. They didn't have fellowship or union with God, right? And so uh, he's inviting them into fellowship. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He is addressing unbelievers in the first chapter of 1 John. Okay? And then John says to them, in verse 8, notice what he tells them. These are Gnostics who believe they didn't sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is, is, is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's telling you exactly what I'm telling you. God's forgiven the world. Come be reconciled to God. I'm preaching to you the forgiveness of sins. If you say you have no sin, you realize why in the world would you need a Savior? If I say I don't sin, I don't need a Savior. But I need someone to save me from my sins. Right? And so he says if you'll admit that, you will be forgiven. You'll enter in. You'll enter into this forgiveness and be free from all unrighteousness. So when you read chapter 1... Please remember that John is addressing this heretical teaching, and he tells some of them they need to stop denying their sin, stop being unwilling to see their sinful condition, and believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and he invites them all to come into the fellowship of the body and to receive total and complete cleansing of all their sins. And then what does he do in chapter 2? Well, he turns his attention to the church. He says, these things I have written to you. To who? To the church concerning those who try to deceive you. That's what he says. In the first chapter, he writes to the Gnostics, and now he turns to the church and says, the reason I just wrote that is because these people are trying to deceive you, and I'm going to prevent that, right? And he's talking about the Gnostics. Now, listen, if you're here today and, and you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've already received total and complete forgiveness from every one of your sins completely they're gone and it's not dependent upon you confessing each and every one of them you know there are sins that you've done that you don't even know you did you know omission is sin the bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin anytime that you don't have faith in a certain area whatever it is maybe it's quickly you just don't believe something that's sin you know the sin of omission is the same of commission god doesn't have little white lies there's no such thing all sin is punishable by death 
There is no small sins. There's no such thing. And so there are sins you forgot that you would never ever... This is not dependent upon you. It was dependent upon one man, and his name is Christ. Now, confession's good, and I'm certain that it's spiritually healthy to do it, but under the correct definition, we need to confess. The word confess here is the word homo logeo. What does it mean? Homo means same, right? Logeo, it simply means logos. It means word. Say the word. What's the word say? Well, the Word says when it it comes to your sin, if you're going to confess your sin, what's the Word say about your sin? That Jesus Christ forgave you of all your sins. That He took care of sin, all sin, for all time. And so when you confess your sin, you simply confess what God says. What does God say? God says in Christ, He's reconciled the entire world to Himself, not holding their trespass against them. Sin's taken care of. So listen, we should agree with God about everything, especially our sin. And so when we know what God says about our sins, then everything's good to go. So when you sin, when you sin, notice I didn't say if. Folks, listen, the reason why there was a sacrificial system under the law is because people didn't stop sinning. And so God had to institute a blood sacrifice to to cover the sin, right? People will not quit sinning as long as they're in the body. They will not. Now, our our heart is not to. I know that because we're new creations. We don't want to. None of us do. We're new created beings. But there are weaknesses in our flesh. We get angry when we shouldn't. We say things that we shouldn't. We do things that we shouldn't. We're always missing the mark. Right? Can we be honest? And so sin, sin in, in that regard can be an ongoing issue in, 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 our, in our lives. But this is what I want to tell you. The good news is God's already forgiven every bit of it. It's already taken care of. You see, when you sin and you come to your senses and you turn around, it's good to confess your sins or to say the same thing about your sins that God says about your sins. That Jesus annihilated them on the cross. He put them away. He didn't cover them with his blood. He totally put them away. As far as the east is from the west, he, the, the words actually means to annihilate with no evidence that it ever existed. It almost, he put it into non-existence. That's amazing. They've been forever removed and destroyed by the blood of the Lamb. Look at Hebrews 9.26. It says he, talking about Jesus, has appeared to put away sin. The word means abolish, eliminate, eradicate, annihilate, wipe out completely as if it never happened. That's what justified means. Just if I'd never sinned, justified. Amen? How did he do that? By the sacrifice of himself. That's why John then turns his attention in chapter 1 after he deals with the Gnostics and, and, and I mean, and, um, After he deals with the Gnostics in in chapter 1, he turns in chapter 2 and he says to them, I'm writing to you, little children. Notice this. Because your sins have been forgiven you. Why? For his name's sake. Isn't that beautiful? And I wrote 1 John chapter 1 to address this heretical teaching that's in the church to to combat the, the, the lie of the Gnostics. But I'm telling you, church, I'm writing this because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. Now, Paul looks at the new covenant and he looks at the, at the work of the cross and he writes these words and, and uh, I believe Paul wrote these words. I believe he was the author of Hebrews, but there are disputes, but I can hold my belief, right? Hebrews eight twelve. he says, this is what he says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Now, that doesn't sound like incremental forgiveness. It sounds like I'll never remember your sins. John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But you can see the tension in the church. I mean, there are literally thousands of Bible teachers who every week contradict themselves. One minute they teach that Jesus forgives and cleanses from all sin and we are possessors of eternal life. And the next minute they say we must constantly ask for forgiveness or we're going to be distant and out of fellowship with God and separate from God and in danger of hellfire. Where in the world is the re- is there rest and peace in that message? How can I ever rest in that message? I can't. The only way um, you're going to make it, if that's the way it is, 
if, if, if Jesus comes back or you die on a good day. In fact, the best thing probably to do, as soon as you get saved, you need to die. Because that's the only sure way that you're not going to blow it. Right? In fact, under that kind of preaching, you know, uh, heaven is, is an iffy for any of us. Right? How often have you heard Jesus will never leave or forsake you, and he's a friend that sticks closer than, the brother, uh, than, than your brother, and, and his, your sins and your lawless deeds uh, he'll remember, remember no more. That is unless, of course, you sin again. And that is unless, of course, he does leave and forsake you. And that is if he does hold your sins against you until your next, next time you get, come to your senses, repent, change your mind, confess your sins, and get right with God. Right? Get yourself straightened out. Folks, under that kind of teaching, when you need him the most, you can depend upon him the least. Because, man, when you blow it, he's, he's gone. Right? Am I telling the truth? This is Christian double talk. That's what it is. It's Christian double talk. And it really makes no sense at all. And it instills fear and unbelief in the hearts of the people. And I think one reason the church did it is to put fear in the hearts of people so that people would actually become more faithful. I mean, I think that might be the intent because they want people to live right. And they think that if I tell people that they could go to hell, that maybe they'll live right. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how this has been passed down all these generations and all these years. And I think we think if we can get people to fear enough that they'll do the right thing. But how many knows you can have people do the right thing externally and on the inside be full of wickedness? Jesus addressed the Pharisees. He said, listen, man, you guys are whited sepulchers, right? You're just graves. I mean, you're just, you're just pretty graves. On the outside, you look beautiful, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. See, God cares about the inside of you. Amen? That's what he cares about. And I think the misunderstanding of 1 John has been used over and over and over to promote this kind of religious double talk. Now, let me ask you a question as I close. Do you think that you're going to sin more because you realize you've already been forgiven? Do you think you will? Listen, those who don't think they've been forgiven for every sin, they haven't stopped sinning either. They do it all the time, continuously. And so every time they sin, they feel like they fall out of fellowship with God. But listen, people like that are still sinning in abundance, right? It hasn't stopped anybody from sinning. <laughs> now, they may try to suppress those fleshly lusts beneath the surface, but none of them have quit. And so their lives are filled now with guilt and shame and the dread of coming to church to hear what they did wrong from some preacher who stands behind the pulpit and beats them over their head for their failures. And that's what they think. Man, you really kicked my butt today. I had people years ago tell me that. Man, you kicked my butt today. Thank you. Really? Thank you for what? It didn't change them. I'll tell you that right now. What I said didn't change nothing. Same old stuff, same, same song, second verse. Didn't change a thing. Folks, all that does actually is breed sin. If you're told you're distant from God, then how are you going to act? You're going to act distant from God. If you're told you're dirty, then how are you going to act? You're going to act dirty. Isn't that true? That's why Peter says when we lack godly qualities, and you read the entire chapter, when we lack godly qualities, Qualities, the qualities I'm talking about that all of us want in our life. He says, when you lack them, this is your problem right here. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, spiritually short-sighted, seeing only what is near to him and has become oblivious to the fact that he was what? Cleansed from his old sins. He says, when all the, listen, when your life's filled with sin, it's what you've forgotten is, is you've been totally forgiven of all of them and sin has no dominion over you. And when you wake up to that fact again, guess what? Sin just falls off to you like water on a duck's back. When you keep remembering, you don't spend all that time, you know, guilt and shame and all this stuff. You, you confess what God confesses, that in Christ all sin has been taken care of and there is no distance between me and God. God lives in me and I live in him. We are one. We're in this dance together. And so God will never leave or forsake me. And even when I sin, God will never leave or forsake me. I sin in him. And you understand? He's always, he's everywhere. And he's taking care of everything. Wow, God's good, isn't he? 
So forgetting that we're cleansed leads to sin, not away from it. It does. So God's not dumb. He knows what he's doing. Grace. He says the goodness of God, God's goodness, will lead you to repent. It will lead you to change your mind. And when I show you my goodness, that's what he said to Moses. I'll show you my goodness. That's all you need is my goodness. That's who I'll show you. I'll show you my goodness. It will change your mind.